Okay, this video today is going to be a review for non-majors general biology bio one. This final exam review is geared specifically to my bio one students, but anyone taking general biology for non-majors at the college or high school level may benefit from this review. This video is going to be different than my regular videos as this will be more of a podcast style video. In cases where images are required, I'll put links to those in the comments below, mainly the sections on human anatomy and physiology portion. So for now, you'll just need to listen, but of course, uh, be safe. Don't listen to this in any scenario where your attention or judgment or decision making abilities are compromised. In the comments section below, you'll find timestamps for each section in case you want to jump around and you'll also find timestamps in the image file, also in the links uh, that correspond to this video. I'm going to cover the entire bio one lecture course in this video and I'm going to go through quickly so you can pause uh, or rewatch as needed. This video is going to be a review for lecture only and I'll have a separate study guide for the lab final. My first quick suggestion is perhaps you watch this video once through and then go back and look at your quizzes and exams you've taken and on subjects where you did very well perhaps you quickly look over those and on areas where you did poorly or missed class maybe you focus on those sections in more detail and as I go through this study guide I'm also going to point out um, about how many questions I'm going to ask you from each section so you can hopefully adjust your efforts and use your time most wisely. Okay, so first up, let's talk about the scientific method in chemistry. You can expect about 12 to 15 questions on your final from this section. Make sure you know the steps of the scientific method. And in my course, I'll tell you very specifically a story about Orange Julius. To, so don't forget to check out that part. So the scientific method first begins with some sort of observation and then step number two is we formulate a hypothesis, which is often referred to as an educated guess. Then we design an experiment and we get results and conclusions. Sometimes results and conclusions are separate as steps four and five. Sometimes they're steps four results and conclusions. To me, it doesn't matter all that much. I will also ask you to be able to identify several specific atoms, and these will include carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. You should also know sodium and chlorine, particularly the ion forms sodium and chloride ion as you find them in table salt. It would also be helpful to know and remember that we have atoms and some atoms gain or lose electrons and become ions. And then we also have atoms that differ in the number of neutrons they have. So carbon 12 and carbon 14, for example, are atoms of carbon, but they differ in the number of neutrons and we call those isotopes. I might show you a picture of those atoms and you might need to be able to identify it from a picture, but I also might instead tell you how many protons they have or how many electrons they have and ask you to identify them that way. I might also ask you how many covalent bonds each of these four atoms can form. And on the subject of bonding, you might get a couple of questions on the three types of chemical bonds we talked about in this class, which include ionic bonds, uh, such as those between sodium and chloride or potassium and chloride, covalent bonds where electrons are shared, and hydrogen bonds, which form due to the fact that water forms polar covalent bonds and therefore does not share the electrons equally. There's a fourth type of chemical bond called van der Waal forces. Those are kind of like hydrogen bonds. I don't discuss them in general biology. I discuss them in majors bio. I won't ask them on my final exam. You can also expect to get a few questions where you have to identify the four basic macromolecules, which include proteins, amino acids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, and lipids. I'm most likely to show you an image of these and ask you what they are. Some instructors might just describe the atoms, uh, but I'm particularly fond of using images. Also, you should keep in mind 
if you are going to be taking a traditional paper exam or are you going to be taking a quiz or test or final exam online? And the reason I bring that up is if you're taking a traditional paper test, most of these images are probably going to be in black and white as photocopies, but online there's a very good chance that they will be in color. I plan to ask at least a portion of my final exam in an online format so when you study you can expect that these images will be in color. But you might want to study uh, to match how your test is going to be because these subtleties can make a very big difference uh, in some students in their interpretation of certain images. Lastly in this section, I might have a couple of questions on acids and bases and what you want to remember here is that the pH scale is what we call an inverse logarithmic scale where the pH of 7 is considered neutral. Lower pH numbers such as 2 or 3 are acidic and have more hydrogen ions than a neutral solution. A pH of 9 or 10 is more basic and has fewer hydrogen ions than a neutral solution. Stomach acid has a pH of about 2, water has a pH of about 7, which is neutral, and oven cleaner and things like lye have a pH of around 12 or 13. The next section I'll cover is cell and cell structure and function, and you can expect somewhere between 12 and 15 questions from this section. And throughout the semester, we've identified several different organisms and diseases relative to these different types of cell types. These include viruses such as COVID-19, the common cold, the flu, and polio. Um, and also we talked about bacteria, which are prokaryotic cells. And infections of this type include things like bubonic plague, E. coli, tuberculosis, um, and many of the sexually transmitted diseases we discussed in lab. And even a few eukaryotic organisms that we call protozoan, uh, such as uh, malaria, um, might also be examples uh, that you have to remember. We also talked about prions, which are infectious protein particles, and we talked about Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease and mad cow disease as the two prion disorders. Um, that you should remember as well. Also remember there are two types of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells include bacteria and organisms in the domain archaea, which we did not talk about very much other than that. Those are things found, say, at the bottom of the ocean in environments like that. And then there are eukaryotic cells, which include all of the rest of the organisms, plants, animals, humans, dogs, and so forth. In this section, I'll also ask you the basic functions of some of the organelles or cell structures, which include ribosomes for making proteins, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, which allows us to convert glucose into ATP, chloroplasts, which takes sunlight and carbon dioxide and make glucose, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which helps detoxify toxic chemicals and the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is important for making proteins that will end up in different parts of the cell. You should also remember that plants and fungi and bacteria all have cell walls, but animal cells do not, and that all cells have a cell or plasma membrane. So not all cells have a cell wall, but all cells have a cell membrane which is also called the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane is important for regulating what moves in or out of a cell. And you could also say that the plasma membrane is important for maintaining homeostasis, which is that internal controlling balancing act that cells must achieve. Moving items in and out of a cell is called transport and certain small non-charged molecules, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, and even small polar molecules such as water can diffuse right through the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane. Charged ions such as sodium or potassium or chloride cannot and must enter or exit through some 
sort of channel protein or through an active transport protein. When going from high concentration to low concentration, this type of transport is called passive transport because it requires no additional energy. There's also active transport, such as the sodium potassium pump, which allows a cell to move chemicals against the gradient or from a low concentration to a high concentration. If you're talking about the passive transport of water moving from high concentration to low concentration, the passive transport of water is often called osmosis. Osmosis is a special type of passive transport specifically for water. Also remember that cell membranes or plasma membranes are primarily made up of what we call phospholipids, which are arranged in what we call a phospholipid bilayer. And each phospholipid has what we call a polar head and a non-polar tail. Passive transport is primarily driven by concentration gradient. So the term hypertonic or hypotonic or isotonic are used to compare, say, the inside of a cell to the outside of a cell. And when you're using these terms, remember hypertonic or hyperosmotic means that one thing that you're talking about has a greater percentage of solute compared to the other thing. Um, so if you're talking about, say, the inside of a cell compared to the outside of a cell, if the inside of the cell has more salt uh, percentage wise than the outside, then the inside of the cell is hypertonic or hyperosmotic compared to the outside. If you have something that's isotonic or isoosmotic, that means that the inside and the outside or two cells have the same percentage roughly of solute. The next set of topics is on cell physiology. And this is probably the most difficult set of topics, I think, in the course. And you can expect somewhere between, I'd say, 20 and 30 questions on this part. And on the final exam, uh, we can often sort of look at topics in an overlapping way, whereas in quizzes or during exams, I might have only focused on the details of one part and then in a different quiz or exam focused on a different part. So on the final exam, for example, I might have questions that in general compare cell respiration and photosynthesis, whereas maybe on a quiz, you only had one of those at a time. And so it's worth sort of comparing both of those as we go. So the main goal uh, or most important part of cell respiration is to make ATP and the most important part of photosynthesis is to make glucose. I'll also remind you that all cells are doing cell respiration or something like it and plant cells and a few other things are doing photosynthesis but plants are also doing cell respiration. This is something that can, people confuse quite often but you do need to keep in mind that plants do photosynthesis and cell respiration. Uh, a little more detail would be that cell respiration can be broken down into three or four parts. I break it down into four parts, but I know that many non-major instructors do it in three parts, and then they have what they call a preparatory or intermediate stage. But in my class, I do four parts, that middle step being what we call PDC, or the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, and then photosynthesis basically has two parts um, and oxygen uh, is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain of cell respiration, which then produces water. And in photosynthesis, we bring water in uh, and oxygen is produced by the splitting of that water in the light reactions of photosynthesis, specifically the photosystem two light reactions. In the light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle, the enzyme Rubisco is used for connecting carbon dioxide molecules together. And that's how we make glucose in the Calvin cycle. And the majority of ATP that is produced in cell respiration is done in the electron transport chain. Also remember that mitochondria are involved with cell respiration and chloroplasts are involved with photosynthesis. DNA, the molecule of inheritance, is a double-stranded molecule of nucleotides. DNA is located in the nucleus 
of a cell when you have a eukaryotic cell. And when a cell replicates itself, it copies all of the DNA using the enzyme DNA polymerase. And it also uses the enzyme DNA ligase to connect the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strands of the DNA. This is similar to, but different uh, than when a cell is utilizing a certain gene for say, um, making the enzyme lactase. So if you drink some milk and you need to produce the enzyme lactase, what happens there is you copy just a specific part of the DNA uh, that we call a gene. We use an enzyme here called RNA polymerase and we copy the DNA into messenger RNA and this process is called transcription. The messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus and it's read in sections of three, uh, three nucleotides at a time. And we call each set of those three nucleotides in a row. We call that a codon and ribosomes and tRNA read basically this message. The mRNA contains codons and the tRNA contains what we call anticodons and they have a specific amino acid on the opposite end. And this chart that we use here shows which amino acid is used. But remember that it's based on the mRNA sequence. So you always need to know what the mRNA is to be able to look out which codons are going to code for each amino acid. Most organisms of living things are what we call diploid or 2N, which means almost the entire organism is made up of eukaryotic cells with a nucleus with two sets of chromosomes in each cell. Now, this ignores prokaryotic cells like bacteria, of which there's probably more of those than anything else. But in bio one, in general bio, we primarily focus on the cell physiology of eukaryotic cells. So I'm going to base basically everything that I tell you based on eukaryotic cells. So it's technically not exactly right, but it is for our particular course because we're primarily working with eukaryotic cells in events where that's not true. I'll point that out. Each cell is diploid because it gets one set of chromosomes from mom and one set of chromosomes from dad. So a human, for example, has an N value, uh, a set value of 23 being in one set. So a sperm might have 23 and an egg might have 23. And you put those together in the starting baby from the sperm and the egg. The zygote that forms from that is a 2N cell that has the number of 40 six sperm and egg get together. They form the baby. Baby's got to develop, but 23 plus 23 gives you your 46 cells that are haploid, such as sperm and eggs have one set of chromosomes in them. And in a human, this would be 23. In most eukaryotic cells, we have two types of cell division. Uh, we have mitosis in which we copy all the DNA and then divide our cell into two and each one has a copy of the DNA sets. We use mitosis for growth or example. I use if you, you know, fall and scrape your knee or stub your toe and you have to grow new cells to repair that skin. It's mitosis that allows you to make copies of your cells that are already there and just make more of them as you damage them or injure them. So the result is you start with a diploid cell, you copy everything inside, and you end up with two diploid cells. Another type of cell division is called meiosis. And this is used when we're making sperm and eggs. So in meiosis, we start with a diploid cell like we did before. We copy everything inside like we did before. Um, and then we're going to go through two cycles of dividing. This ends up resulting in four cells, not two, and each is basically a haploid cell or has one set of chromosomes. Another unique point about meiosis is that in prophase one of meiosis, our sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes are going to form structures that we call tetrads, and they're going to go through a process called crossing over in which parts of the chromosomes can swap place. And this is unique to prophase one in meiosis. It does not occur in mitosis and it results in genetic recombination, meaning the chromosomes are mixes of what they originally started as. After protein synthesis, we move into genetics 
and you can expect somewhere between 12 and 15 questions on the topics of genetics. These topics are connected because when we talk about the phenotype of an organism, it's often based on the coding sequence of the DNA, which we call the genotype. So the phenotype is often the physical outward appearance and the genotype is the genetics that led you to that. And we often use a letter to represent a dominant allele or dominant sequence of DNA. And we use a lowercase letter to represent a recessive sequence of DNA. Uh, so a flower, for example, that has purple flowers, if purple flowers is dominant over white flowers and that's coded for by one gene, then you could have two alleles that are the same if you had a purple flower and we would call that homozygous dominant and it would be big P, big P. So purple flower would be the phenotype. The genotype would be big P, big P. Uh, or you could have one copy of each and that would be a heterozygous. So you could have a purple plant that is big P, little P, because in this case, we're assuming purple is dominant over white. And the recessive condition would be what we call homozygous recessive. And it would be little B, little B. And again, the phenotype in this case, this would be a white flower and the genotype in this case would be little b, little b. Gregor Mendel was an Augustian monk who's generally cited for starting the field of genetics with his famous pea plant hybridization experiments in the 1850s. And it might be worth reviewing my Mendel video in the link below to sort of just help remind you kind of what Mendel did and how he got his particular results. We discussed a variety of genetic conditions that are recessive and you should know the examples of Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia. And we also cover some dominant traits such as a chrondoplasia, Huntington disease, and polydactyly. There are genetic conditions in which multiple alleles or co-dominance exists. An example of that would be the ABO blood type system. And we also have some traits such as colorblindness and hemophilia, which are what we call sex linked and are on the X chromosome. Uh, other conditions uh, such as Turner syndrome, Kleinfeld syndrome, Down syndrome result from what we call uh, non-disjunction. So during uh, um, separation, during uh, meiosis, sometimes the chromosomes don't separate properly. We call this non-disjunction. And then there are some cases like Cree de Chat, for example, in which we have a piece of chromosome that gets what we call a deletion occurring. Okay. From genetics, we move on to evolution and ecology, and you can expect somewhere between, I'd say 20 and 25 questions on evolution and ecology. Darwin is generally credited for the theory of evolution by natural selection in his book of origin of species in 1859. And once again, I made a Darwin video that might be helpful looking at one more time, and I'll put that in the links below. Evolution can simply be defined as a genetic change to a group of organisms over time. This is often divided into two levels that we call microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is simply small genetic changes that occur over short periods of time, such as measuring changes in allele frequencies over a short period of time of days or months or years. Examples of this include the antibiotic resistant activity we did in lab or the predator prey example we did also in lab using ants. Macroevolution examines changes uh, in, say, the fossil record over many thousands or millions of years or even billions of years. It can also use DNA changes or similarities to infer maybe how species or groups of species might have changed over time. Based on the radioactive dating of fossils, uh, we believe that the Earth can be divided up into four sort of distinct categories we call eras. Uh, these are the Precambrian, which occurred between 4.6 billion years ago to 544 million years ago. The Paleozoic, between 544 million years ago and 245 million years ago. The Mesozoic, between 245 and 65 million years ago. And then what we're currently in now, which is the Cenozoic, 65 million years ago to present. And sometimes um, people get confused by the order in which these are listed, but imagine it's a deep hole and the deepest part of the hole was a long time ago and the top is more recent. So 
when you organize these or you think about them, uh, think about at the top of your page or chart is where the Cenozoic would be. It's at the top of this deep hole. That might help you kind of orient time a little bit better that way. Important evolutionary events for the final that you should remember are that in the Precambrian, the Earth was formed, which we believe was around 4.6 billion years ago. The first bacteria appear 3.5 billion years ago, so it's about a billion years with no life on it, we think. The first eukaryotic cells appear about 2.2 billion years ago, and most of the early basic life forms are present by the end of the Precambrian. But the Permian extinction, which was probably caused by volcanic activity, ended up wiping out about 90% of life forms. Each era is marked by some sort of large extinction event uh, that occurs. So the next being the Cretaceous extinction 65 million years ago, which wiped out most of the dinosaurs. However, birds are considered dinosaurs, so they made it through. The oldest Homo sapiens fossils are about 117,000 years ago but based on using DNA evidence and what we call molecular clocks, we think that maybe humans, Homo sapiens, maybe evolved around 200,000 years ago. So the oldest fossils, 117,000, based on the DNA, it's maybe around 200,000. So it's somewhere in that window there, and we're always working on that. Despite what you might have heard, it is not believed at all that humans evolved from monkeys humans evolved from other hominoid ancestors, which go back several million years. The branch that gave rise to humans, apes, and monkeys probably occurred 10 to 15 million years ago. After we talk about evolution, we move into ecology and we begin talking about how individuals interact with the environment that determine how evolution will play out. We often discuss a group of similar species as a population and it is in fact populations that evolve or change over time. If you add all the populations together, this gives you what we call the community level. This is all the living components uh, of a ecosystem. And then if you add the abiotic or non-living components, you end up getting what we call the ecosystem. Ecosystems vary from location to location. And one big factor is the heating and cooling of the earth because the earth rotates around the sun at a tilt of about 23.5 degrees. You get a variation in what we call solar input, which gives us our seasons between zero and 23.5 degrees. You get pretty much constant 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark throughout the year. This results in a heating of the air at the equator, which the air then rises, it condenses, and the rainfall that's in that air rains. And so this is where we get um, our tropical forests at. The air continues and descends at 30 degrees north and south of the equator, resulting in deserts. Um, however, our deserts in North America are not at 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Instead, our deserts are the result of what's called a rain shadow effect where we have mountain ranges. And when the air travels over a mountain, it cools and it drops its rain. And so where Mount Sac is, for example, we are typically we are on what we call the windward side of the mountain. And if you go over the local mountains at Mount Sac, that's where the deserts are. And that's when when the rainfall drops either at Mount Sac or going up the mountains, it drops. And then as it goes over the leeward side of the mountain, it is dry. And that's how we have our local deserts. The largest ecosystem is the taiga. Uh, at least for terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, if you go north of the taiga, you get the tundra. Tundra is, is defined by what we call permafrost, and permafrost is land that does not unfreeze. It freezes and basically never unfreezes because it never gets warm enough in the tundra to unfreeze. Ecosystems can be impacted by a variety of forces such as volcanoes and meteors and so forth. But in recent times, humans have had a tremendous impact on the environment. Currently, three to four species are going extinct per hour uh, due to events like deforestation. Global warming or climate change, climate change being the preferred term for global warming now, uh, climate change uh, has 
um, far reaching effects like sea level rise and increased storm severity and increased human population, increased food production, increase the amount of CO2 being produced while deforestation takes away some of the organisms that can remove the CO2. Increased CO2 levels are trapped in the environment and they act as a greenhouse gas resulting in the greenhouse effect and that warms the planet. That's the term global warming. So as a general rule, um, the planet is getting warmer. There are areas on the planet that are getting colder. And so the term climate change is preferred and is more accurate because it depicts the uh, concept that what is really happening is there's differential changes in the Earth's climate with many areas getting hotter, but some getting colder. And those places historically have not had those types of atmospheres. And so that drastically impacts the way wind and water move, for example, and all those can have long term potential effects. After we discuss ecology, we move into a bit of focus on the human anatomy and physiology of primarily humans and general biology. In our general biology course, we focus mainly on human anatomy and physiology. And this section usually is at the end and our students usually do the best on this section. And you can expect somewhere between 20 and 30 questions uh, on anatomy and physiology of humans. And uh, there are four types of tissue we talk about in this class, epithelial tissue, such as your skin, connective tissue, such as bones and ligaments, muscle tissue, such as your skeletal muscle that you work out in the gym or at home or wherever you do it, and heart or cardiac tissue. And then the last one being nervous tissue, which is primarily, you can think of as being components of your brain and your spinal cord. We look a little deeper at the individual cells found in the nervous system, including individual cells that we call neurons. Neurons are slightly negative when they are at what is called the resting potential and they become positive very, very quickly in milliseconds when they fire and go through an action potential. Remember what creates the resting potential or the slightly negative condition in a resting potential is you have a protein pump called the sodium potassium pump and it pumps three sodium ions out of a neuron for every two potassiums it pumps in and there are sodium and potassium channels that are closed and that results in you're pushing more positive things out and less positive things in which results in a slightly negative resting potential which can change very quickly during the action potential. The individual neurons work together in clusters to perform certain functions and different parts of the brain are therefore responsible for certain actions. The pons and medulla oblongata, for example, are important for regulating basic physiological functions such as swallowing and breathing and controlling heart rate and blood pressure. Behind this region is a separate section of the brain called the cerebellum, which is important for coordinated body movements, such as those types of things found in martial arts or dancing or riding a bike. So a different part of your brain coordinates the initial movement of say dancing or riding your bike, but the coordination involved and how your body has to move to perform those is controlled by the cerebellum. Uh, we also have the hypothalamus, which mainly controls the pituitary gland, which is important for releasing hormones such as ADH uh, to help regulate water and growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimulates the thyroid gland and helps you control metabolism. The largest and most human part of the brain, if you will, is the cerebrum, which is involved with what we call complex higher thinking. And it allows us to do things like learn math and biology and foreign languages and paint and that kind of stuff. We discuss how single cell organisms can rely on things like simple diffusion to get nutrients in and out of a cell, uh, like we do when we talk about transport. Uh, but as an organism gets larger, humans, as an example, require special adaptations to handle the large number of cells packed so closely together. So we have a four chambered heart, for example, that pumps nutrients throughout our body. The arteries lead away from the heart and generally turn into smaller 
blood vessels which become capillaries and that handles the exchange and then the fluid returns to the heart via what we call veins. The right side of the heart consists of the right ventricle and the right atrioventricular valve and the right uh, atrium and the right ventricle is going to pump blood uh, up through the semilunar valve to the arteries, the pulmonary arteries, which will eventually go to the lungs. Then the blood comes back via the pulmonary veins back from the lungs, and that carries primarily deoxygenated blood back to the left atrium, which then is pumped from the left atrium to the left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts and pushes blood up the aorta. Also remember that the heart produces two normal distinct sounds that you can hear with a stethoscope. We call these the lub dub sound because a heart sounds like it's making the lub dub lub dub lub dub sound and that is due to the closing the lub the first sound is due to the closing of the atrioventricular valves and the dub the second sound is due to the closing of the semilunar valves so in both cases they are the closing of the valves that produce the sounds that we can hear in the heart left side of the heart is thicker the ventricle wall is thicker uh, because it needs to work harder to push blood throughout your body so blood's going to enter the left side of the heart via the pulmonary veins which are returning with full oxygen saturation from the lungs from the left atrium blood's going to be pumped to the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular valve and then through the semilunar valve on the left side also known as the aortic semilunar valve which then travels to the rest of the body a small percentage of your blood pumped through the body does not get reabsorbed directly into the circulatory system. Instead, it gets pushed into smaller vessels that we call lymphatic vessels. These vessels often lead to several nearby lymph nodes, which have to be packed with white blood cells, which function in your immune system. And although you have white blood cells throughout your body and elsewhere, these lymph nodes have dense collections of them which allows the immune system to sort of sample what is moving through your body and these lymphatic vessels eventually dump back into the right atrium there are many types of white blood cells but for bio one on the final exam just remember that you have b lymphocytes b cells can attack from a long distance by releasing antibodies but t cells need to directly attack a cell and there are many interactions that occur between B cells and T cells and the other types of cells. Um, but for bio one, particularly on the final, um, just keep in mind B cells make antibodies and T cells are um, need to directly attack a cell. Gas exchange in humans occurs in the lungs. Air is going to travel into the mouth and or the nose down the large trachea, which is also called your windpipe. And at the end of the trachea, respiratory system branches into a right and left bronchus. The plural form of this word is called bronchii, so you might have heard that as well. Um, so a bronchus, or if you're talking about both of them, that's called bronchii. And these respiratory tubes then continue to get smaller and eventually into microscopic sacs that we call alveoli, and it's the alveoli where the gas exchange actually occurs. Next up, we have the digestive system and starting from the mouth like we did with the respiratory system food is going to enter the mouth and while it is being chewed up that's when digestion is beginning with the chewing up of your food first with the chewing of your food and then also with enzymes like salivary amylase that are released by salivary glands in your mouth which helps break down carbohydrates such as starch when you swallow this food, your trachea moves upward towards your head, and this allows the opening of the airway to be closed off by the epiglottis. This acts like a shield to prevent food from entering your trachea. Instead, it moves down the esophagus, which sits right behind your trachea. Food moves down the esophagus to the stomach, where the acid in your stomach help to begin digesting proteins, food then moves into your small intestines. The first part or first portion of the small intestines, about 12 to 14 inches in length, is called the duodenum or duodenum. 
I personally say duodenum, but over the years I've asked many anatomy professors and you'll hear both of those terms, duodenum and duodenum. So the duodenum also has vessels that come in from bile duct and the liver and the pancreas. There's a large number of kinds of chemicals being digested in the duodenum. And despite popular belief, most digestion and most absorption of nutrients occur in this part of the small intestines in the duodenum and not in the stomach. The stomach primarily is for food storage. Most digestion, most absorption occurs in this duodenum, which is part of the small intestines. Okay, the food continues to the rest of the small intestines, which is approximately 20 feet in length. So while the small intestines is longer than the large intestines, um, the small intestines has a narrower diameter. On the lower left side of your body, the small intestines ends and it meets up and connects to the large intestines. In this junction, a tiny sac called the cecum has a finger-like appendage that is packed also with blood cells, with white blood cells. We call this the appendix, and the appendix is often called a vestigial organ, meaning you don't need it, uh, but it does serve some form of immune function, which is probably more significant in our evolutionary history, but often a very sharp pain in the lower right region of your body will lead you to the ER where an emergency appendectomy uh, can be performed uh, in which they remove it very, very common uh, if you have an infected um, appendix that it is removed very quickly because it can rupture and, and cause a, a systemic infection through your whole body. The large intestines continues up the right side of your body, then across laterally, and then descends on your left side of your body where your feces then is going to exit your rectum. The main function of the large intestines is to absorb water from the feces. And when the large intestines does not do its job, due to a variety of reasons, what you ate, injuries, pathogens, so forth, diarrhea is a very common side effect. And since we're down here, we might as well talk about the reproductive system. And starting with females, uh, we have eggs that are produced in the ovaries uh, via meiosis. About one egg is produced per month in females, and the release of that egg, which is called ovulation, is due to a slow rise of two hormones released by the pituitary gland, and those are FSH and LH. Those stand for follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And those two spike, causing ovulation. The egg leaves the ovary and it travels into the fallopian tube, which is also called the oviduct, same structure. And if fertilization is going to take place, it generally happens somewhere in the fallopian tube. And the egg, once it's fertilized, if it is fertilized, it then implants in the endometrium wall where it begins to develop into the baby. In a male, meiosis occurs in the testes and produces sperm. And unlike females, egg, uh, unlike the female egg, and unlike the female egg of humans, sperm are generally smaller and reproduce at a very rapid rate. I mean, like a crazy fast rate, like 1500 sperm per second are being produced. Uh, the sperm uh, mature in what's called the epididymis, and then both the epididymis and the testes sit in the scrotum, which is a sac that basically keeps the testes and the sperm out of the body cavity, which is generally warmer. This allows the sperm to develop and be sort of stored at a lower temperature than typical for body temperature. Okay. Upon ejaculation, the sperm are propelled up the vas deferens and up into the area of the body cavity, but still in the vas deferens. They pass through several glands, which include the seminal vesicles, um, which supply sugar, the bulbourethral gland, which secretes a type of lubricant, and the prostate gland, which secretes an alkaline solution to help neutralize the acidity of the 
vagina and sperm pass through these glands and travel out the urethra. And then that is it.